Hello, thank you very much for joining us during this uh, talk. I'm Roberto Mentivoglio in the city of uh, Radical Beat, and we have also with me here Saverio Velzi, that is our solution architect for, for the product. And uh, we'll give you. It's not working? Perfect. I'll probably the, the arrow. Devian, no? you have to go there with. The Try again. Okay, now. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So a little bit about Radical Beat. So Radical Beat is a film about first data. We start with our product during the 2015, and we released our first product that was um, first data distribution, a complete stack with Flink, based completely on Flink, Apache Kafka, Cassandra, and other frameworks. After that, we start uh, working with pro projects on our distribution. And finally, this year we work on a new product is a streaming solution for analytics, real time analytics, streaming analytics. And it's the demo that we are seeing in our stand in in the main uh, in the main room. And um, so uh why we are here? Because we are speaking about a database, because during our the working on our products that is a uh, streaming analytics solution for uh, as a, as a self service solution end to end to from in, in ingesting the data as a TL solution until showing the dashboard and the widget the graphical way so is an end to end solution uh, as i said before so we need um, something that is was a time series database so we start uh, look around in the market. So we look and we try open source project. But many for many reasons, we, we, f we didn't find a good solution to put inside our mm, technological stack. So um, the first reason was a license reason, because a lot of products have open source Apache license or MIT license. It is really good, because we are working with open source. And we would like to have Apache license free with our products. Um, but often, a lot of times, this database has um, Apache license for the standard solution, but data types, features like clustering, often are not uh, open sourced. So we can use that in production. Or the other solution was too complicated. So a complicated stack with a lot of framework inside that it was too complicated to for us to support that product in production. And also, a lot of product times, the database has a, a really expensive OEM pricing. Also, other product doesn't really fit very well with our idea to stream the data. So we'd like something a publish subscribe feature. So we'd like to push the data directly from our uh, backend application, our server side application, directly to front end. We'd like to push the update that uh, our analytics solution is creating. And uh, so finally, our idea was to start a little bit crazy to start to implement our own database. And also because we'd like to have uh, use the technology that we'd like to, to use. And so we are a fan of Scala. And we decided to use our, to implement our database using Scala and mainly to use Akka as an uh, uh, engine to distribute the, the computation. This is the uh, diagram that I think that most of you really know very well. is the CAP architecture archi schema. Is mainly we have, uh, oops. Sorry. OK. So we have here an input source, the data of data. We have uh, the topics where we put the data. So it's like the journal. We have here a versioning job. And finally, we have this that is the serving layer. We are focusing on this area with this database. We have here um, output table that are versionings. And we have a client application that are asking for the, for the data. So they are pulling the data from this database, from this view database. So we have one database that is the right side database, and the read data. The, and the, on this side, we have the read database. So if you think about a common query responsibility segregation pattern, this is the right side, this is the read side. And uh, we, there are a lot of challenges implementing a CAP architecture. One of is about to. Um, uh, all, all the stuff is a streaming event, so we are managing all the data as a streaming event. It's really, really cool, uh, what we would like to have in our system. And there are a lot of solutions on the uh, journal side, so we can use Kafka, Provega, Cassandra. 
but it's not often so to to find for um, on the other side a, a, a solution that really fit well with streaming analytics application. And so also this is the reason why we we decide to to because our main our application is based on a cap architecture. So for this reason also we decide to 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 implement in this way our database. So we are not one that our client application ask for the data. We'd like to push every time that we receive new event here, we'd like to push the data directly to the client application. And anyway, the cl client application, if they want to, they can ask the data to the Salvina database, then in, uh, executing and ask to execute the query to, to the database. This is the main feature that we have inside our database. So we have uh, a database for a time series database, so optimized for that. We have a uh, focus on uh, read performance, for sure, because we are on the read side. And we like to have high availability for the data, because we are on fast data, let's say big data uh, world. So we had high availability. We need clustering, for sure. We need. Um, feature that is said publish subscribe so we'd like to push the data uh, on the front end and we are using WebSocket for that. We'd like to support a SQL like query language. So something that everybody can use and everybody that know very well. We'd like to have fluent JavaScript API main if possible using a DSL. For sure, we'd like to have an Apache Flink integration because we are using Apache Flink as core inside our system. We'd like to have an integration with too many, many languages as possible. For this reason, we choose to implement our client feature using gRPC, that is a Google RPC system, that is uh, that offer a lot of, is implementing on top of Protobuf, offer a lot of uh, final languages of uh, choice, so you can use that uh, with Go, Python, C++, C Sharp, and many other languages like, uh, for example, for instance, Node.js. Um, we'd like to have a versioning of our table that is called, they are called metrics. Uh, we'd like to have native Apache Auto support because we are using pipeline and data from the pipeline is coming from Apache Kafka and Apache Kafka is uh, using the Lily in a good way Apache Avro. So we'd like to use Apache Avro for to have a, a native support for Apache Avro inside the database. Uh, we'd like to have a GDBC support to integrate external tool, uh, like let's say BI, BI intelligence solution like Power BI or other application like that. And finally, for of course, an uh, import-export feature. This is an overall architecture of our system. We have uh, is built our core engine, our storage is built on, on top of Lucene. So we are not implementing all, all the stuff from from on a blank page. So we are using Lucene for that, for store the data. We have implemented a commit log. So when we receive data, we write the data before in a commit log, and after that on Lucene. All the stuff is implemented using the feature of Africa cluster. Then we have a gRPC server to, to permit to the to the client application to interact with our server. We have uh, an ACA cluster reception that is a feature that permits to have a PC also on ACA cluster. And we are using this feature only with the command line interface. We have a web socket, uh, of course, for that we have ACA HTTP. We have Scala API, Java API, and the Flink Sync. The Flink Sync is implemented on top of the Scala API at the moment. So. Is the time so of Severo. So now it's my turn. Good afternoon again, everybody. So during my part of the presentation, I would like to show you a little more in details the architecture and the core components of the database. So in this uh, slide, you can see there are three black circles, which are the three main components of the database. There are the write coordinator, the read coordinator, and the publisher. The write coordinator is the component uh, which has the responsibility to handle all the write requests that comes from uh, the Scala API or from Flink Sync. Then the read coordinator is the component responsible for handling all the, let's say, traditional read requests. I mean, if a client asks a query to the database, the read coordinator is responsible to fetch the data and give it back to the client. And there is the publisher, 
which is the component who is responsible for the real-time feature Roberto mentioned before. A little more in detail about this feature, we can see a sequence diagram that supposed to describe it. So first, the client must subscribe to, a, a, to the publisher providing a query. This subscription is made by the WebSocket protocol. So the client must open a WebSocket and give a message to the database providing the query it, wa it wants uh, the data for. Then the publisher will fetch the historical data and return it back to the client. And then every time a record is written to the database, in case if it fulfilled the query, it will be returning to the client. This is an example. So assuming we have an event written to the database by the Flink Sync or the Scala API, there are two tasks that are being run in parallel. The first task is for writing, doc for writing the event into the, into as a Lucene document, and then there is another parallel task that check if uh, uh, there, is, uh, there is a client that submitted a query that fulfilled that event, and in case this check is positive, the publisher forward the event to every client. So this is uh, the, the, um, the real-time streaming feature. But the other um, important topic we have to deal with is scaling, because uh, uh, of course we want to to provide uh, an high availability system, distributed system. So dealing with uh, scaling, this is the, the, quest the first question that came in our mind. So how would it be possible to scale a generic SQL or NoSQL workload, a generic one? I would like to ask you this question, but this is the best answer I've found so far. <laughs> Because the point is that uh, in many SQL or NoSQL database, the, the way you can partition and so scaling data is by using a proper partition key or a proper column family. Uh, and this is a the, the way you partition the data is uh, inside the semantic of your data. In order to in order to scale properly a uh, gen generic or a time series workload, you need to define boundaries. Before starting to talk about how we decided to partition and scale our data, we need to define a little bit what we mean for time series and what, um, in, in which way we, we define our data structure. So, we decided to call our time unit bit, it's just similar to our company name. Uh, it has, of course, a timestamp, which is a standard uh, epoch timestamp in milliseconds or nanoseconds. It has several dimensions, it could have several dimensions, which are key value pairs. Mm, they can be numeric or string values. And it also has one value which can be a numeric one, integer or float, uh, but only numerical. That being said, our boundaries are that this bit, these bits are immutable. immutable. That's very important because uh, bits can only be inserted, never updated. And of course, time series data are naturally ordered by time. That's <laughs> our conclusion about thinking about this. So making the metaphor that timestamp is time and dimensions are space, we can, 
we, we decided to partition data across time and space. The space partition is demanding to Lucene, which uh, has a proper index structure for dealing with it. And we decided to, to deal in a custom way the time partitioning. So for example, I, uh, it's only enough to configure a parameter, which is interval. Interval means that uh, in every shard that can be a chunk of data from timestamp 0 to timestamp, according to this example, to timestamp 0 plus 15. This is an example. Let's suppose we have okay, <laughs> an interval of 15 seconds, sorry about that, and uh, uh, three nodes. So and imagine we have a flow of time series data continuously written in the database. So in the first node, we will write the data from 0 to 15. In the second node, the data from 15 to 13, and so on until the number of available nodes are reached, then what happens? We will start again from the first node available. On the other side, when it comes to read from this kind of sharding, this is the best case. Let's assume that uh, we receive uh, a time range query from T1 to T2. The read coordinator has got its metadata and knows where to fetch data, in from which shard to fetch the data. So it only make a query against the first shard. This is, and no further action is necessary. In the average case, let's assume we must do our, our time range query from T1 to T3, this involves two shards, so the read coordinator must query these two shards, but there's no need to merge the results because the, the, the data chunks are disjointed from each other because it's been sh it, they are sharded by time. So no merge strategy is necessary and only, only a potential sorting can be necessary. This is for sake uh, <laughs> the, the, worst, the, wor the worst case, but it's pretty straightforward. This is the, the most unfortunate query we could process. And uh, it's time to switch back to Roberto. Okay. So let's introduce a little bit ab about uh, our structure that we have inside the database. We start from the namespace. The namespace is the high level construct of our database. The namespace is like, um, you can see a uh, namespace like a namespace in Cassandra or a uh, database in a relational uh, storage system. And we have uh, this structure that is group uh, the metrics. The metrics are like a table in the relational world. And the metrics are a series of points that we call bit inside the database to, to recall uh, the name of our company. And, sorry. And uh, we have the, um, for sure, a timestamp because we are in a time series database, so we need a timestamp to save the timestamp for, for each value that we write inside the database. We've, we have a value, and the value is a numerical value that we want to, uh, to, to measure. So it's something like uh, you can see as a integer along, a double, a float, something like that. And finally, we have dimension. Dimension are like label or tag, uh, are like a, a dynamic set of key value pairs. So for instance, one row, let's say I think about one bit, can have 10 dimension, and the same metric, another bit can have two dimension, and the third row can, uh, uh, another length of the dimension could be 15, 20 dimension, so it's dynamic. 
the schema is dynamic, so when you write the data inside the database, the database every time um, it creates the new schema. So if you create a new, uh, after some time you create a new bit containing new new dimension, you uh, in dynamic way change the schema of the database. So you you don't have to that to to that that manually. It's all automatic. So let's look at uh, uh, some code that maybe is more interesting, <laughs> and hopefully, and uh, this is Scala code. So we have here an object that is an SDB object. We connect to a host. So we have here this local host, and we have this port, and we have to pass here an execution context because in Scala, without an execution context, it's impossible to work with future. So after that, we have the SDB value. So we have to use this value, we have to call this method that is namespace, so this is a fluent DSL, that's something like this is a fluent API, not a DSL. So we, like, we, we have to call a, a given namespace, so namespace registry, we have to use a bit order amount. This is the name of the method that we want to use. Value is the value of the method that we want to measure, so this is the value, 34.20. And we have here a uh, two dimension, and we have the city, this is barely, and the giant that is male. After that, we can simply write, this is an example of uh, to write the data using Scala API. So we can write here, we are writing here the CDS that we create here. So it's a CDS with a single bit, it's a single record. And the T is called return a future because all the NSDB is implemented in non-blocking way and non-blocking or all async using future. So we are using hack and so it's not blocking all the stuff, all the code inside the, the database. And so when you have to manage the future, we have to on complete, you can check if it's a success or if we have a failure. And so do you, you do some things to, to, to manage the result of the, of the writes. And uh, this is an example of database that we are using the database with the sync, uh, with a sync API that we, wrote for a flink. So we are here a uh, sentiment analysis is something that we are something bind to the demo that we are showing in the in the main room. So we have here a uh, data steam. That data steam is uh, about tweet sentiment. This has the class that we are using. So we are flat mapping this data and we are creating a scoring. And this is finally data that we have uh, here. So uh, a data set of tweet sentiment. And uh, we we create this sync, so we have this tweet sentiment, and we we create we have uh, to create a function that map our data set to another uh, construct to another structure that is our bit. So is a function that converts the tweet sentiment to a bit. So to specify the bit, we choose a namespace, a metric, and we put here a dimension. In this case, a key is the scoring. So it is coding because we have some sentiment analysis here that is positive, negative, or neutral. Or neutral, so it's like a label that we put inside this key, and finally a value that is fixed to one because we'd like to to count the occurrences inside the database. So we would like to count the the Twitter are positive, the Twitter are negative, and the Twitter are ne neutral. So we we put one that is mean that that entity has value one, so we can count and put together all the stuff. And finally, we have to bind our data stream with the sync. So we have here the, the sync that we created and the data stream that we have, that we have written before. And so that, that's, that's all that we have to do to, to use the sync for with the sync uh, API with Lean to, to write inside our database. Okay, so just to give you a roadmap of our project, because the idea is to open source this project uh, by the end of the next couple of months, two, three months. Uh, we'd like to a little bit to finalize some stuff and to clean up the code and to get some documentation, uh, better comments and so on to to make the product to be to be ready to use uh, usable by by other uh, people that are not inside the company. And uh, for sure, we're including that release uh, clustering, clustering features, um, the Java, Scala API, and gRPC support for sure, uh, the Flink connector all in the sync, because the source 
is not so meaningful for this database because we are on on the final part just to to, to push the data to to be read by the final application uh the web socket feature that we already see in the demo that somebody showed to us and the command line interface to to look around to 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 select the data and to explore the the format of the table and so on in the further release we at least we'd like to to have some other feature after that we'll hopefully maybe we create a, at least a little community around this database uh we'd like to have um a better integration with a system like Pravega and Apache Kafka. So we'd like to ingest directly the data from Pravega from Kafka. Uh, a native Apache Avro management. So we'd like to expose REST API where uh, the client application can call us and we, we return a schema Avro compatible. So it could be useful for people that are using Apache Avro with Kafka. Uh, we'd like to have uh, GDBC support thanks to Apache Calcite that is already used by uh, Apache Flame Project, uh, SSL and Kerberos support, uh, and many other features, and hopefully uh, the community will ask for, s for something else in the future. So that's all for, for our database, and thanks for, for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, we are happy to, to answer to you. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Thanks for the talk. So, um, your distribution model based on data, on time slots, basically, it's smart, but how do you make it resistant to failures, like of one node with respect to the others? How do you deal with redundancy by somehow? By using, uh, by using replicas, by using replicas. So, uh, besides having um, having the shard we 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 shown before, we also we also have replicas. So, in parallel of writing uh, data chunks, we also replicate it in other nodes. So that's the way we we manage uh, fault tolerance. Are there any other questions? Okay, well then let's thank again our speakers, Roberto Ventivoglio and Saverio Veltri from Radical Bit. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.